is Chris Reese, and he'll be speaking on dissemination of the results of pediatric clinical trials funded by the U.S. National Institutes of Health. Thank you very much for that introduction. I'm thrilled to be here and to have the opportunity to present on behalf of my co-authors who are listed on this slide, uh, none of whom have anything to disclose. In the way of background, the National Institutes of Health, or NIH, is the largest source of government funding for biomedical research in the world. However, only 11% of the NIH's annual budget is dedicated to pediatric research. This is in contrast to research for adult populations that receives large amounts of funding from pharmaceutical companies. Pediatric research is largely funded by federal and philanthropic sources. Thus, as pediatricians and pediatric investigators, we rely heavily on the NIH and its funding to drive research in the field forward. Timely dissemination of results in all forms, be it positive findings, negative findings, and even failed studies, is crucial to ensure evidence-based clinical care, to uphold the integrity of scientific evidence, to maintain ethical obligations to trial participants, and to inform future research. Thus, there is a need to ensure maximum research and scientific output from grants awarded by all funding agencies, but particularly the NIH for pediatric research. The NIH itself has specific requirements related to timely, uh, related to prospective registration of clinical trials, as well as timely dissemination of results. The NIH requires that clinical trials that are funded by the NIH be registered prospectively, meaning within 21 days of trial initiation. Regarding results dissemination, the NIH requires that results be posted to clinicaltrials.gov within 12 uh, months of trial completion. However, an understanding of timely registration, timely dissemination, and publication rates for NIH-funded pediatric clinical trials is lacking. However, this understanding may help inform future efforts to ensure timely dissemination of findings from NIH-funded pediatric research. Here, our primary objective was to determine rates of publication of NIH-funded pediatric clinical trials. As secondary objectives, we aim to determine time to publication of NIH-funded pediatric clinical trials to assess the timeliness of finding, dissemina finding dissemination. Additionally, we aim to determine factors that were associated with time to publication of NIH-funded pediatric clinical trials. To accomplish these objectives, we conducted a cross-sectional analysis of NIH grants funding pediatric clinical trials. We used several sources of data for this study. First, we used NIH Reporter to identify grants that were classified by the NIH as funding pediatric research. We also used clinicaltrials.gov to ascertain results reporting. And lastly, in order to link awarded grants to publications reporting the results of trial interventions, including safety and efficacy outcomes, two of our team members searched three sources. Again, we used NIH Reporter and publications that were linked to grant entries therein. We also searched Medline via PubMed for publications that may have been posted there. And lastly, if we couldn't find publications through the aforementioned methods, we reached out to principal investigators directly via email to ask if there were publications for these trials that we could not find. We selected all grants funding pediatric clinical trials that were completed from January 1st, 2017 to December 31st, 2019. We selected this time period to provide at least two and a half and up to four and a half years of follow-up between funding completion and the publication of pediatric clinical trial results. From an analytic perspective, we assessed time to publication using Kaplan-Meier analysis. Lastly, we identified factors associated with time to publication using a multivariable Cox proportional hazard model in which we adjusted for a variety of available factors that were theoretically associated with time to publication. Now on to our results. We found that there were a total of 414 grants um, that funded pediatric clinical trials uh, during the study period. These 414 grants provided over $900 million in funding for pediatric clinical trials. As you can see in this table with grant characteristics on the left-hand column and simple descriptive statistics in the right-hand column, Nearly half of these grants were R01 awards and 11% were K awards or career development awards. The most common funding amount was less than a million dollars in 42% of the included grants. 
Interestingly, behavioral interventions were by far the most common type of interventions, well over drug or device interventions for children. 88% of the funded trials were randomized controlled trials, and surrogate measurements were the most common endpoint employed. Surrogate measurements, for those who are not familiar, may include things like measuring adherence to a medication, like a controller medication for a condition like asthma, as opposed to measuring hospital admissions for asthma, which would be a clinical event. Clinical events were employed second most commonly, and last scale measurements were the, uh, may include things like measurement of pulmonary function tests for something like asthma. The majority of clinical trials were indeed registered in clinicaltrials.gov, However, only 64% of them were registered prospectively, meaning within 21 days of trial initiation. And again, that's an NIH requirement. There were 303 grants that had at least 12 months of follow-up from trial enrollment completion. Among those, only 14% had results post posted in clinicaltrials.gov within the NIH's required timeframe. After a median follow-up of 36 months, only 23% had results posted to clinicaltrials.gov. In this Kaplan-Meier curve, you can see the number of months after funding completion on the x-axis and the probability of publication on the y-axis. We found that the probability of publication of NIH-funded pediatric clinical trials at 24 months after funding completion was only 28%. After 48 months following funding completion, the probability of publication from NIH-funded pediatric clinical trials was only 54%. Among the 201 NIH-funded pediatric clinical trials that were not published, there were over 57,000 participants who were enrolled and these grants represented a total investment of over $300 million from the NIH. In our multivariable Cox proportional, proportional hazard model, we accounted for a variety of factors, including the year a grant completed, funding amount, funding institute, intervention type, enrollment size, and participant age. In this model, we found two characteristics that were associated with time to publication. Results from trials who had surrogate measurements as their endpoint were published in peer-reviewed journals slower than those with clinical endpoint and events as their endpoint, excuse me. Conversely, trials with sample sizes larger than 300 participants were published sooner than those with sample sizes less than 100 participants. Like all studies, this study's results should be interpreted in the context of several important limitations. First, we cannot rule out the potential that we may have missed some publications of health-related outcomes related to NIH-funded pediatric clinical trials. We attempted to overcome this limitation by searching for publications in several sources, using two different investigators to, to do this search, as well as reaching out to the principal investigators directly. We only counted publications on health-related outcomes. Other outcomes such as feasibility may be valuable contributions resulting from NIH funding, but we did, not account, we did not count those in our analysis. Lastly, of course, there may be other unmeasured factors that influence time to publication for NIH funded pediatric clinical trials that we could not account for. So we learned a few things here. Um, in conclusion, I'd like to say that our findings suggest there's incomplete compliance with NIH requirements for prospective registration of clinical trials, and timely submission of results to clinicaltrials.gov. Our results also suggest that it takes time for funded clinical trials to result in peer-reviewed publications. Lastly, our findings suggest that additional efforts are needed to improve research reporting practices and to advance the translation of research findings into evidence-based clinical care for children. This may include greater oversight and ongoing benchmarking of registration and results dissemination to improve pediatric clinical trial results uh, reporting practices. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to take any questions. Perhaps all the questions were asked to my Canadian colleague. Steve? Hi, uh, great work, very depressing. Um, as bad as the reporting has been shown in adults, this, this is actually arguably even more depressing given how hard it is to do this work. So one question is, uh, you know, the NHLBI did, did, this, did a study that shocked even them, even though everybody was telling them exactly how low the publication rates would be. 
Um, and, and now you're showing, you know, yet worse for pediatric uh, studies. Uh, from what institutes did this come? And can you feed it back to those institutes? Because it's that feedback that I think will stimulate them to do exactly this sort of benchmarking you're talking about. Because if they report to Congress that, you know, 33% uh, of the money is just flushed away, um, you know, that's, that's not going to enhance their prospects going forward. Yeah, great questions. So uh, that New England Journal paper that you are, are alluding to with the NHLBI, that's what inspired us to do this in pediatrics. Um, in terms of institutes that were involved, so the major institute is the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, or NICHD. Uh, I think that was the primary funder on 56% of the grants. But you know, NICHD is one of the least funded institutes within the NIH. So oftentimes what happens, multiple institutes will fund one award. Um, and I couldn't give you the breakdown of the others, but it kind of is a hodgepodge of all the other NIH institutes that contributed to this. In terms of feedback, um, about a month ago, the Office of Inspector General actually put out a report where they did their own internal audit. Um, it wasn't pediatric specific and they selected 76, I think, uh, grants that they had awarded um, and found similar things to, to what we're seeing here. So they're aware of it. We were very happy to see that. We've been working on this for months, obviously, but obviously the NIH is aware and they're taking action. Thanks. Thanks, Chris, that was a great talk. I have two quick questions. First, did you look at what that percentage of other awards were? Because R21s are often pilot studies but would be listed as clinical research without being intended to be filed in clinicaltrials.gov, for example. And then secondly, did you look at the percent research effort of the investigator? In pediatrics, as you know, <laughs> We often don't have time and um, researchers, the lead PIs may be only 30% protected research time. And I wonder if compliance correlates with the amount of time that's being given. Specifically, if we can identify a cutoff, this is the minimum percent that you need, then maybe that could be used to help institutions better support researchers. Yeah, great questions. Uh... We don't have access to the percent protected time for each of the awarded investigators, so we can't do that analysis. Um, and then your other comment about R21 awards, you know, by nature not being necessarily uh, things that would be resulting in, you know, peer review publications of the trial. So we excluded anything that wasn't a trial. And so those, those others are indeed kind of a hodgepodge of, of various things. I'd have to look back at our data to tell you exactly how many were R21 specifically, uh, but anything that wasn't specifically a clinical trial with health-related outcomes was excluded altogether. Hi, uh, Cameron Avassi from BMJ. It also applies to Mohsen as well, because his talk was uh, very similar. If we look back, I think it was 2004, ICMJ said, made a big statement about trial registration. We hope to change the landscape uh, of reporting, of publication, of funding, of how academia behaved, how primarily industry behaved, how funders behaved. Um, and I think we have to accept the data you've shown and data that we see almost every week is that we failed, okay? We haven't achieved what we set out to achieve. So the question I've really got to both of you and to everybody here is what are we going to do now? Because whatever we did 18 years ago has spectacularly failed. We now need to do something different, something more effective. We live in a world of preprints where data, where results are shared prior to publication in a journal. So why can't we think of something radically different? Um, why can't results be posted initially on a trial registry before a journal considers them. I think there has to, I'm not saying that's the answer, just thinking out loud. There has to be something different that's done now because you know, this, is a, this is a big failure on all our parts because we haven't achieved what we set out to achieve. Uh, I share your sentiment. Uh, I, I think that is one thing that clinicaltrials.gov is designed to do. You are able to post your results there. And, and um, you know, just to be explicit, that's the NIH's requirement is that results are posted there within 12 months. The NIH doesn't have a requirement that your results are published in a peer reviewed journal. Um, and, and I think we all know there's a different degree of, of rigor um, once you get to that final stage. Okay. Well, Zach from Picori. So you've told us some predictors of poor performance and follow-up, but 
I'm interested in some explanatory variables. And one of them I wonder about is the outcome of the study. Uh, in my experience, studies that try to change behavior often come up zero. And so I encourage you to go the next step and try to identify some reasons for it based on your admirable data. Yeah, ter terrific question. Um, I, I think uh, we've thought a lot about this, but I, I think the natural um, assumption that we all make is that the trial had negative results. And so because of the publication biases, those results weren't published. Yeah. Or indeterminate, not explained. Right, right. So I, I think the way we get around, or we're, in our heads, we're thinking around that is we're looking at results posting to clinicaltrials.gov, which you know it shouldn't matter if you have positive or negative findings because that's not a peer-reviewed process. Well, I take that back. The NIH reviews those yeah. results before they get posted, but it's not as if there's an editor sort of deciding if that's going to end up in their journal. Uh, but you're right. The next step, kind of as was said with Anissa's presentation, would be to, to do a qualitative or even a quantitative. Uh, sort of study to try to assess among these investigators why these things aren't being published. Thanks. Of course. Let's hear from our virtual participants. Gerben Turriet of Amsterdam University asks if you see a role for medical research ethics committees or IRBs uh, in compelling, incentivizing proper behavior in terms of registration and publication and comments whether some version of a list of authors disqualifying list of authors who didn't adhere with funders requirements would be effective in yeah, changing behavior. I confess, I, I don't know, I'm not the police of this situation. I, I don't know what the right solutions are. I don't know where that accountability falls. Uh, I think within NIH funded awards, you know, the NIH has entrusted those investigators with that money. And I think they've done a good job now that they're starting this and they've done this investigation and they're moving forward to, to police this a little bit more internally. Um, in that same report that I mentioned in response to a comment earlier, uh, they're actually putting together a workforce specifically to, to address monitoring for of prospective registration as well as trial, uh, trial result posting, excuse me. But I don't know if it falls on the IRB or who it falls on, but we need some sort of accountability. Thank you. Hi, Usman Munir, Yale School of Medicine. Um, could you talk a bit about how the sample of studies you looked at might include products regulated under the Pediatric Research Equity Act? Um, and is there any overlap or are those completely separate? Uh, we didn't have something that flagged anything that would fall under that act, so I, I can't speak to that. Sorry. Thanks. Uh, Evan Karish, I'm an editor-in-chief of the Biomedical Journal. I'm also a recovering university vice president for research. <laughs> And in listening to the to the conversation, and obviously the theme has been repeated um, within this meeting. It's also sort of been repeated over the course of many years. It's a little surprising why it's so surprising. If we look at the business model in which research is done in pharma compared to the business model with which it's done in academia, uh, in, in academia, it's very ephemeral. Uh, it's done grant to grant, and, and the grants are largely funded for the implementation phase, not the authorship phase. Uh, you finish enrolling, and right away you're on to trying to get your next grant. And the process of getting that grant has been made even more difficult, uh, particularly for clinical trials. Uh, it's also become increasingly difficult to enter and interact with the registries, i.e. trials.gov. So you're again consuming more and more effort of investigators into something which is largely not productive. So I think that I'm sort of preaching to the wrong group here, but if we wanna communicate messages about how to do this better, um, I think that the, the agencies need to have a better understanding of the research ecosystem and the implications of the rules that they make upon that ecosystem and its ability to carry out the mandates and the unfunded mandates uh, that they're putting on those ecosystems. 
Thank you. And I'll take the chair's prerogative and ask one last quick question, which is, I don't think this will change your results as it follows the pattern of many of the other studies we've heard from, but is it possible that the pandemic delayed publication and that because of the sample and time that you took in a year or two, your results might change just because things were delayed? We had that same question. Um, we accounted for a year in our multivariable model and even those that had completed in 2017 and 2018, you know, as much as three years before the pandemic really hit, uh, didn't have any, there was no difference in their time to publication. So we had the same assumption, but it doesn't seem to be the case based on our numbers. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank the audience for uh, being such a large in numbers later in the day after lunch and um, being so attentive. And I'd like to thank our presenters and uh, this session ends. Thank you. <laughs>